Hey guys. Uh, we're already a bit in, uh, into time, so uh, I'm delighted to get started. Thanks for all joining us on this stage. Um, the topic we'll be discussing on this panel is aggregating knowledge. Um, to give you a bit of a background of why this is relevant to effective altruism, uh, there's the line that all of you can see on the back of your program booklet. EA is about figuring out how to do the most good and doing it. Um, and the figuring out how to do the most good part is actually really hard. Um, most people who do research aren't looking at the big picture. They aren't asking the question, how can I do the most good? But instead, how can I figure out this part of the problem that is relevant to figuring out how to do the most good? So taking all of these small pieces and putting them together into something that informs our final decision is a really tough problem. And I'm really excited that our panel is going to help us address this today. Um, our, the person moderating the panel is my colleague, Tara McCauley. She's the Chief Operating Officer at the Center for Effective Altruism. Previously, she was a pharmacist with the Red Cross and traveled to 33 countries all around the world doing uh, her pharmaceutical work. Uh, she also worked as a data analyst to find efficient improvements in hospitals. The first speaker is Amanda McCaskill. She's a philosophy PhD student at New York University where she studies rationality and infinite ethics. Then we have Sarah Constantine, who's a data scientist interested in using algorithms to solve practical problems. Her research is in analysis and machine learning, and she once led a 40-person team in an early-stage startup. Next, we have Julia Galef, the president and co-founder of the Center for Applied Rationality, who writes about rationality in many, public, uh, many uh, journals and publications online, and also runs the Rationally Speaking podcast. And finally, we have Heidi McNally Linz, who is the Senior Policy Communications Manager at Innovations for Poverty Action. She works across the organization to help researchers share evidence with one another and has experience in nonprofits, communications, management, and collaboration. Thanks to all of you. If you want to submit questions for the panelists, feel free to go to this link, and they'll take questions after an introductory Q&A. Have a great talk. So I think this question of aggregating knowledge is really central to effective altruism. So we focus on figuring out how to do the most good and then doing it. But in the world with five billion different web pages and academic papers being published every single day, knowledge is being produced at this rate um, that we've never seen before. And then on top of that, there's such wide variance in the quality. You, know, you can look at hundreds of different studies on a particular topic and still not know what to do. So there are increasingly greater challenges in how we can aggregate all of this information when we have a specific question that we want to answer. And then once we've done that, how we can incorporate our findings into the EA discourse when we make decisions, talk to our friends, think about where to donate, what research to do, or even what to study next. And then, as well, we have problems with communicating that our findings, figuring out how we can convince others and talk to them about what we found. So all of these things are central to EA, central to how we can figure out how to do the most good and then actually do it. And I'm glad we're going to have a wide-ranging discussion here, touching on all different aspects of this problem. So, and our hope is that uh, at the end of this, you'll be better equipped to sort of go out there, answer some of these big, big questions, and figure out what action to take. So, Sarah, I guess I'll ask you a question first. So you were introduced mostly as this data analyst, but I know your work mostly from your blog. And I think many people in the audience have probably read a lot of the research that you've done there. And you've done some really interesting stuff on you know, answering some of these big questions when taking this large sphere of knowledge and condensing it into something that's really action focused. Can you speak a little on that? Sure. So um, let me just go into what I do because it's a little bit uh, off the beaten path. So my formal training is all in math and statistics and that sort of thing. But a few years ago, I worked at a company called MetaMed that was, the goal was to analyze what's actually evidence-based in the world of medical treatments for people who have unsolved or incurable medical problems. Um, so you've gone to a bajillion doctors, they've told you, uh, we don't know what to do, you're looking for options. Okay, what do people like, what do people who have symptoms like yours or diseases like yours, what can they do that may not be particularly common knowledge but actually is well justified? What are the experimental treatments and so on? And we had some incredible success stories and it sort of taught me that just because something is out there in the scientific literature doesn't mean that 
everyone knows about it or everyone's already putting it into practice. There is actually more than the system, so to speak, is capable of aggregating and interpreting, especially when people have very individual cases. So this is, um, the, the, the company's gone, but um, this continues to be my hobby. Um, I'm writing a book about cancer research, sort of to the, the effect of um, a lot of the more recent progress in cancer research is not particularly strong, um, and there are m more promising research directions that seem to be pot potentially better. Um, and essentially, I do lit review on my blog and so on, and basically, it turns out to be, in my opinion, very fruitful and possible to put together okay, what do we actually know about, for example, STDs? Um, just the basic um, well-established facts, what works and what doesn't, um, how, how high is the risk, um, and it's actually, though, though a lot of this stuff is not remotely controversial, there isn't a place where you can go and just see everything in one grid in one place. Um, and I think that kind of knowledge can be very useful um, and is a thing that we could do a lot more of in EA for trying to just um, put all the facts in one place about questions that are live and important. Why do you think some of these like traditional aggregators of knowledge might be failing to answer this question? I mean, we have the Cochrane collaboration, we have things like Wikipedia. Like, where, where is this gap? So I think those are all very good resources. Uh, the, uh, you mentioned the Cochrane Collaboration. They do meta-analyses, very large systematizations of, of the literature. Um, and they're great. Um, and they spend you know, about a, y a year or more on each Cochrane Review, and it's very sound. Um, and if you go to the Cochrane Review to try to find out the answer to a question, like, should I, should I floss my teeth? This is a good example. It came out and was all over the media. Um, what the Cochrane Review actually said is that they, there aren't very strong studies saying that flossing your teeth helps. This does not mean we now know that flossing is less effective than previously believed. Uh, it may just mean that nobody has gone to bother to study about it. Um, the problem with things that evaluate on the basis of is the research good enough? Has it met certain thresholds of excellence or care um, or scale? Uh, is that when you're trying to decide a problem based on its importance to you, um, what should I do in practice? What should I, uh, where should I give to charity? What should I do with my own health? Um, you aren't necessarily saying, well, if the evidence doesn't reach a certain threshold, I will do nothing. Um, it may still be completely reasonable to floss your teeth, um, even if the evidence base is weaker than it is for other Health, uh, healthy activities. So, you know, I think, I think you see failures when, um, when institutions are under pressure to do what's justifiable rather than what's optimal. Cochrane Cochran will only say there's strong evidence for something if they can never be accused of being in error. But as human beings making decisions, we're always running the risk of error. So we're not looking for what's justifiable, we're looking for what's good. This is something that occurred to me actually after reading your excellent report on the STD, like the state of STD research. Mm -hmm. uh, what occurred to me is that probably a lot of the gaps that we can, like the low hanging fruit in doing these kinds of analyses that Sarah does, uh, that I would expect those gaps to occur in cases where the, um, the people or the institutions giving the advice don't have the same incentives that we do. So mm -hmm. like their incentive is to make sure that they can't be blamed for, you know, not warning people sufficiently about the risks of every single sexual act. Right. Uh, they don't particularly care about our pleasure and our happiness with our sex lives, uh, so they have, you know, no, no real incentive to say, you know, well, uh, this activity is somewhat less risky or, um, you know, this m method of transmission is, you know, the evidence isn't great about it, so it's probably safer. There's just no reason for them to say that. So if we, you know, want to make decisions for our utility functions, we have to, you know, go out and collect the information ourselves sometimes. This, this ties in really well into some of the work that you've done, Amanda. I know some of you might have seen Michael Kramer yesterday presented this great slide on how we should continue to create more evidence or seek out more evidence until we reach the point where the cost of doing so exceeds the expected value. So Amanda, like, are there many other frameworks we can use to sort of figure out how to act if we have so much uncertainty? Uh, so I think this is like an important point. Um, I don't know how much 
uh, of the stuff he kind of covered yesterday, but um, when, we're th when we're making decisions um, under kind of extreme uncertainty, I do think it's important um, to think, people are very inclined to think that the thing that they should keep doing is gathering more and more evidence rather than acting. And I think that makes a lot of sense because when you're acting under extreme uncertainty or when you're acting under ignorance, um, this does a couple of things. Firstly, it means that your credences in each um, of the options available to you are like very uh, non-resilient. So they're prey to move around a lot in response to new evidence. Um, so this, this is one of the reasons why the value of information is really high in these contexts because um, I expect that in the future, if I gather evidence, then the expected goodness of my actions will actually outweigh the cost to me of gathering that evidence. Um, another feature is that it means that you tend to be more in the middle on issues. So when you have a lot of ignorance, you, your credences tend to move towards the middle and less towards the extremes. Um, so this can mean that you're less confident that what you're going to do um, is going to be uh, good in expectation. Um, but I think that one really important factor here that people can forget is the cost of delay. Um, so to my mind, the best thing to do um, is to explicitly think about the cost of gathering further information. Um, is it the case that there's actually more information available to me um, in the near future that's going to make up my mind on this issue? Um, sometimes people can get kind of paralyzed um, when they realize that they just, you know, they've got some incredibly good intervention on the one hand and some incredibly good intervention on the other hand. Um, and they're quite ignorant about which one is going to end up being better, but they think it's somewhat more likely that the first intervention is better. Um, it's really important to think about if I'm deciding between researching for six months or um, just going ahead and giving the money, say, to, to uh, cause A, um, how much more information am I actually going to gather in that six months? Um, because that's quite often a cost. Um, so I think, yeah, when we're making decisions under ignorance, the main things are what's the cost of delaying in order to gather the information, and then how good is this information in an expectation? Um, do I actually think that there's something in the world that I don't know that's going to make a huge difference as to like, what I should do? Heidi, you probably encounter this problem a lot in your work at yeah. IPA. So how do you, how do you handle this trade-off as an organisation? Yeah, so um, I, for those of you who don't know, I, IPA uh, is a research and policy nonprofit, and we, we research what works and what doesn't um, for the poor around the world and trying to figure out what kinds of effective solutions there are. And obviously, we work really closely with j Powell, so you'd expect me to agree a good bit with, with Michael Kramer on this. But um, I, you know, I think one of the things that we really... Um, we've really seen a lot as we've started to talk about our work in the media more is that, um, it, you know, <laughs> the, the media does obviously take this and kind of change a lot of, of a lot of what the research says and so and part of that is because as researchers we want that information out there and so we're willing to compromise it a little bit but the thing we've learned is that you can't right <laughs> otherwise people lose trust in you right so you know this this particular study about flossing your teeth right like the, it, it, they need they they as as Cochrane you have to be kind of a little clear about what the what the evidence is on that but you need to coach the media and consumers of media on how to understand that um, and I think that's something that that we need to do a little more often. Happy to talk more about that. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, you'll see all of these news stories where they report on some really strange finding, and it's a completely different to the study. Right. So I, I guess, like, an interesting question this brings up is how we can identify reliable sources. You know, for every single question, do we have to actually dive into the academic literature ourselves, or how do we determine who's an expert and who could comment well on the topic? Yeah, um, go ahead. Julie, no. Well, I have a like personal request about that, which is, I think it's both inevitable and fine to um, to draw a lot of your credence on a topic from the opinions of other people who whose judgment you respect, who have looked into it. Like, I'm not going to do all of the research on nutrition myself to decide, you know, what uh, diet to follow. Other people have done that. I, I can trust them. Um, my personal request, though, is that when you're telling other people in your intellectual or social community about your opinions, that you, you flag, like, I believe this because I trust the judgment of so-and-so who I think has looked into it. Because otherwise, we just get this kind of cascade effect where, like, like when I first moved out here, you know, the paleo diet is super popular. And, and I put a lot of credence in it at first because all these people were like, oh, yeah, it's very reliable. The evidence is, like, super solid on the paleo diet. And when I dug into it more, I found that... that Almost none of them had looked into it, I mean, understandably, but they, had, they were just citing the uh, 
the judgment of someone else who had cited the judgment of someone else who had looked in. So there were like two people who had looked into this at one point, like five years earlier. But like 25 people told me it was their opinion that it was like very solid. So I just feel like our communities, our epistemic uh, hygiene would be better if we uh, if we credited sources more. Yeah, and and I think that's that's one place where um, people who communicate well need to do a better job of partnering with researchers and being really careful. And so one of the things I do a lot at IPA, and we work with you know over 400 researchers and have about 600 studies. And when I'm trying to talk about someone's study, I'll, I'll sit there with them or on the phone and kind of like go back and forth and push as far as I can to make something accessible um, and be like, but is that accurate? Is that accurate? And I think like there's a there's a partnership that's lacking um, that kind. Of the, and, and questions that we all need to be asking when we're when we're looking at looking at studies and asking the researchers about that as well. Go ahead. So I would like to make a push for just incrementally lowering your barrier to looking things up um, a little bit. Um, <laughs> nobody can be an expert on everything. There are many things that I am. I sh shrug my shoulders and say, this is not my field. I do not understand that it would take me too long to get up to speed. But I have been surprised over and over again to know how much more accurate and knowledgeable you can be by when you hear a claim, check. Just maybe, may, maybe link to the paper and skim it. Maybe look at the Wikipedia article. Um, the, I started out. Um, sort of on this journey because sometimes I would hear extremely controversial claims and I'd be like, is this pseudoscience? Is this reliable? Is this guy a crank? And I would worry about this and feel like I have no way of telling if it's a crank or not. And now, years later, after having been at this for a while, it's actually, if you go check the person who wrote this thing and they are making fallacious arguments or using really terrible data or their experiment didn't have a control group or whatever, um, the majority of the time when it's completely nonsense, a reasonable person can detect that it's nonsense. Sometimes when something looks like it might be legit, you, you, it may still be wrong, that's fine. But like, have confidence in your ability to check this out because that's the way you can prevent things that are completely bunk from spreading. They're not actually that most, most bunk is pretty easy to recognize, and it's worth taking five minutes to see, oh, okay, does this, does this make no sense at all? Okay, uh, I don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> so I don't disagree with that per se, mm -hmm. but I think what I'm more concerned about than the bunk in mm -hmm. this, because I think this community is like reasonably good at, or I mean, compared to the average, com good at detecting like pseudoscience and bunk, mm -hmm. but, um, but there can be there can be what seems to be a consensus among scientists on a topic, um, and you like do your due diligence. You're like, yes, these studies seem solid, and uh, there's you know lots of evidence. But there's this whole other vein uh, of of discussion uh, among seemingly equally good scientists that totally disagrees and is not cited by the first collection of papers. And so you can right. like I was reading this this like huge lit review of studies on of some something to do with animal consciousness. Uh, maybe it was about whether fish are conscious, and the, and this paper was like it's been solidly settled. Here is the you know half page worth of citations of studies showing that fish are conscious, um, and then later I found another study with a similarly long list of citations <laughs> showing that fish are not conscious. Yeah. It's actually really complicated and difficult right. to know what you're missing. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, that, that that definitely is a challenge. Um, it's just um, I I kind of. I have a lot of hope for the prospect of how much more we will know if we have more eyes on the ground and more people reporting on what they notice. Yeah. Um, just because no one person can do this, if we're a community that's, that has some, some shared goals in finding out yeah. what interventions are helpful and so on, to have more people note what they find out and looking, at, looking in different places. Yeah, I think like, curiosity is such a central part of what it means to be an EA, and we do need a lot of people looking at this information. Mm -hmm. But I really like your idea, Julia, about how we can better communicate our certainty around an issue. Amanda, can you say oh, something yeah. about that? You yeah, I just had thoughts on this, which was like, I actually think that citing your sources when you say things is generally a good thing, not just when you're, uh, not just when you've received it from testimony. So like when I've received it from testimony, I'm just, basically what I'm saying is, hey, in this case, I'm, you know, sometimes people get called like thermometers for truth. You know, so you're like an expert, someone with like a large body of evidence and who is a good thermometer. Um, and so 
this means that like when lots of people are independently gathering evidence, like what we've said, um, you get lots of thermometers who are independently checking how things are in the world and not just how other thermometers are. And then when people are just doing it by testimony, they're just like having a look at the other thermometers um, and kind of like uh, responding to that. And so it's not useful. You're right. You get these cascade effects. You know, if I'm if all the thermometers are just looking at each other, then suddenly you get to yeah, you, you get this huge uh, feeling that you're correct when in fact you know it's just that everyone's like looking what everyone else um, believes. I, mean, I, I do think there's a little extra information being added because you know by citing someone else or look, pointing at another thermometer, you are saying like I think this is a good thermometer. Yeah. Which is it's just like not nearly as much as an independent um, yeah thermometer. an independent assessment. Um, and I think so. I think not only. Uh, Sometimes I do this just where I'm just very explicit. You know, I think sometimes we, we get embarrassed by where we know, like, we found out about things. So sometimes I'm like, I'm pretty sure that one night when I had insomnia, I read a study in some <laughs> random journal. It was probably, like, second tier. Um, I, just read the, I just read the abstract and the conclusion, and it said this. Um, but I seem to remember finding it convincing. And sometimes I'll, like, yeah. say that after I give, like, you know, I'm like, you know, I believe X. And then this, I'll, I'll give you this story about my insomnia. Um, but some part of me feels like that's good because I'm just telling you how much confidence you should have in my statement. Um, and sometimes also, I think there's, there's negatives and positives to seeing how confident you are in something. The negative is it can seem like a hedge and we can be really tempted to, you know, we don't want to be attacked by other people so we'll maybe say, oh, I'm only somewhat confident in this. But sometimes I think it's like good to also just flag how confident you are in a claim. Um, you know, sometimes I think it's useful to discuss things and we just say things that we actually are relatively confident are false because we think it's useful for the discussion. You've been actually naming a credence, right? Like saying, I, I think this is 20%. Yeah, sometimes I think naming your credence can feel a little bit alienating um, in ordinary conversation. Like just being like, I mean, I could just have like a little ticker, and it's like, oh, I'm now down to 0.22, or um, <laughs> oh, now that now that now that he's said, it, I'm I'm down to 1.7 or something. But like, yeah, um, yeah. Like, um, but I do think that like we have like lots of like useful words that let us kind of, um, you know, I'm pretty confident in this. I'm almost certain in this. Yeah. Um, uh, this has been proven, therefore I am certain in it. Like these things are like useful things to flag, I think. But but I also think we need to encourage people to interrogate some of that, right? Because it's yeah. it, there are certain brands that you can you can trust, but that's because the, these brands have been really really careful about the way they use their words and the kinds of things that they say, right? So you know, IPA and JPAL and Givewell working on on off of off of a lot of that research have been really careful in the way they talk about that, and so people can then trust when we come out and say things. But I think when you're looking at um, there's a couple rules of thumb we can mm -hmm. encourage people to look for. You can look for peer review, and so like that's an obvious one in published journals, but it's a little harder sometimes when you've got working papers and they they, they're not the same. Um, and I think one of the things we encourage, we talk a lot to reporters about this, trying to help them get different angles of the story. Um, and we encourage them to like talk to the person who disagrees with what I'm telling you, yep. and even make the intro <laughs> to the person who disagrees with what I'm telling you. Um, even though they kind of find that a little frustrating, most reporters actually do want to do the due diligence, they just don't have the time. And mm -hmm. so I think as, as a community here, we can really help them to do that. And you know, I was reading, I can't remember what the study was, it was one of the one of, one, yeah. sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. It's exactly what it was. Um, uh, it's the one and recently in the New York Times about the um, racial profiling and gun violence, right? Um, and I started reading that article. I'm like, this is like impossible. And I get halfway down the article and I see the sample size and I genuinely don't remember the the number, but it was like it almost made me laugh. It was so low. Um, and so another thing you want to look at is sample size, right? If you're you know the difference between something that's a couple thousand versus like less than a hundred is really significant. So the couple rules of thumb like that, um, I think, is really helpful to. Start start like really spreading out to people to, to really interrogate the knowledge that way. Yeah, Can I add one thing? yeah please. Um, so there is something that um, surprisingly few people know about um, called effect size. Um, yes. Effect size matters a lot. Yeah. Um, so yes. if you look at the difference between some kind of thing you measure with an intervention and not, um, and you divide by the standard deviation, um, you have a universal measure of how big a deal it is. And you can, so, I, I'm serious. Um, you, can, you can sort of intuitively gauge things like, okay, an effect size of more than 0.7 or so is significant. An effect size of 0.3, you probably wouldn't even notice it or feel it if it hadn't been pointed out to you. Um, and that, the, thing, the, the great thing about being really 
really persnickety about I only trust high effect sizes um, is that it washes out all the statistical noise. Um, and you're a lot less likely to be picking up something that has been gamed to just float under the p equals 0.05 level or something you know, where people are intentionally deceiving you or just fooling themselves or want to see a little effect or there's, a, there's publication bias. Um, just say, if it, isn't, if, if it doesn't have a really huge result, I'm going to be a little bit more spect skeptical. Um, and that, I think, takes care of uh, it's, it's, it's actually mathematically equivalent to some of the more fancy statistical techniques that you'll see in good meta-analyses. So just be a little pickier than you normally would. Yeah, and I guess effect size is basically the thing that tells us how to act, yeah. right? Like, if, yeah, if it's a much larger effect size, then we need to actually change what we're doing. Um, Julia, I've been dying to ask you, there's a, in the EA community, I guess we, see a, we talk a lot about updating and what we should do when we encounter new evidence. And I think this is a, a really important thing with the effect size. Like, what should we do when we see a study that is like, completely surprising, that we disagree with, that challenges everything that we know? Like, how, how can we sort of get better at uh, seeking out new information that we disagree with and incorporating that into our understanding of the world? Well, I think most people intuitively have this sense that when they encounter a piece of information that really challenges some fundamental piece, some, some piece of their network of beliefs, uh, that they have two options. Either they can uh, accept this new result and overhaul their entire you know, huge chunk of their worldview, or they can find a reason to dismiss the new piece of evidence as unsound or irrelevant, um, or they can like, just ignore it with no justification. Um, and the first option seems just absurd, far too extreme, and so people go for the second option. And I, I don't disagree that that first option is too extreme. You know, most of the time, a new piece of evidence is not going to be overwhelming enough and credible enough to justify overhauling a huge chunk of the network, that, like of the set of things that you believe about the world. Um, and in fact, this is not how science works in, in its ideal form even. Like when, uh, when there was some results that came out a year or two ago about new, faster than light neutrinos or whatever, like science didn't say, well, I guess we were wrong about relativity, let's throw out all the textbooks. They said, interesting, I'm betting this is false, but let's you know, wait and see. Um, and you know, sometimes these, these anomalies do accumulate over time to the point where you get this, this paradigm shift and, and you're forced to sort of step back and say, okay, uh, all things considered, cumulatively by now, uh, it is more likely, uh, like this data is, is more explainable under this new theory, um, like, like uh, heliocentrism than geocentrism. Um, but that does take a while. And I think having that model of of what to do with new challenging evidence that you sort of keep it in, it's like putting it in like a junk drawer in your kitchen where like you keep the things that you don't wanna throw out because you might need them someday, but you're not gonna do anything with them just now. Um, having that model makes it much easier to uh, accept and even seek out to be curious about new information that might challenge your worldview because you don't feel like encountering it forces your hand right away to instantly update. So, so far on this panel it seems we've talked a lot about how all these other people are wrong. Right, like lots of research. We, you know, we're going to go out and seek out new evidence and then figure out what to do. So I'm going to ask a more controversial question: What things do you think that the EA community is wrong about right now? How, what thinking areas are we making? Where are we overconfident or perhaps too committed? I have a lot to say about that. <laughs> uh, uh, so without speaking to particular object level uh, topics, there are a few categories of what seem to me to be thinking errors in effective altruism. And this is all with the caveat that I think this is a very sharp group that are much better at reasoning than the typical person. Uh, however, one category I want to point out, uh, I will label with the handle the sophistication effect. Um, this is a, a phenomenon that has been experimentally demonstrated in which people who are especially smart and well-informed uh, often do not end up with more accurate judgment because their intelligence and their uh, education makes them better at coming up with justifications for believing whatever they wanted to believe in the first place. 
Uh, and I think that certain frameworks that effective altruists tend to use to analyze things, like utilitarianism, for example, as a, a moral framework, uh, lend themselves very well to this kind of like clever setting up of, uh, of a mechanism that happens to justify doing the thing that you want to do in the first place. Uh, like, you know, well, of course I should get the last piece of pizza because uh, my commute is five minutes longer and if you look at the studies, uh, eating half an hour before driving makes you a better driver and I'll be less likely to have an accident and kill someone, so it's the utilitarian thing to do to give me the last slice of pizza, to pull an example out of the air. Uh, <laughs> So, so that's one thing. I'll briefly mention the second category. Um, Can I ask yeah. About that? So like that, presumably that effect works more if you're in isolation. So if you're, because I assume this is like, uh, if I'm really good relative to other members of my, my intellectual group, then presumably. Good meaning smarter, Yeah, if smarter clever. or better, just coming up with these justifications. So sometimes I don't trust the people who seem like they're the smartest member of the group for this reason, because I'm just like, well, they just don't have enough people. Maybe like this group can, in like as an aggr aggregative body, can challenge this person. But I am a bit worried that they're just going to be able to kind of argue their way around anything. But I don't expect that to happen if I have like a large body of knowledgeable and very good people. Because if someone gives me that just so story about like a utilitarian thing, I'll push back on, on it and be like, no, that's just not true. Like this isn't in fact the most effective thing for you to do because we can run the calculations and you're wrong and you were wrong on these three points. So that seems to depend on like whether they're an isolated actor or Act, interacting with a group of very like intelligent people who are willing to challenge them. I do think that that makes it better, but I still think that as a community we have, we're not all independent. We have some shared biases. Yeah. Um, shared there's, interests. Presumably. Yeah, there's you know things that are just in the air because a lot of us are in the Bay Area or in tech or have mathy backgrounds. We like subjects that are like intellectually shiny and interesting. Maybe we don't like subjects that feel like lower status, like like. Politics, like, you know, my dumb Uncle Bob argues about politics on Facebook. Like, I don't want to be interested in politics. It seems, you know, dumb and boring and cliche. I'd much rather be interested in, you know, uh, fancy stuff about new tech that can change the world or, um, or the, the subject of, of economic development research. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things I would encourage the EA community to adopt more is kind of humility in the way we talk about those things. Um, and I think that'll get us a long way in growing the movement if we want to grow from 1,000 people here today to 10,000, 20,000 people in a couple of years. I think, um, yeah, being being humble about what we do and don't know is really is really critical, um, particularly when we're aggregating knowledge. Um, uh, and and c because people do trust us, we are confident and we do know a lot. Um, but we have to back that trust up um, quite a bit um, when we communicate. And um, I actually always tell people to be really suspicious of the new flashy technology until there's like solid randomized evidence behind it. <laughs> um, and uh, and I know that's not very popular in this room probably, but um, a, a lot of the studies have, and particularly in international development, have shown that that's, there's reason to be suspicious. Yeah. Um, so. what, what do you think we can do as a community to better incentivize saying, well, I don't know, I haven't looked into this very much, and I'm really uncertain here? What, Sarah? Um, so one thing that I think is really important to avoid is a sort of argument from authority or the belief that some institution has everything sewn up. Um, if you actually read GiveWell's blog, they will, they, they repeatedly say, we have not sewn up the question of what is the best charity. We are not telling you um, what is the best way to save the most lives per dollar in the world. Um, we are telling you what we've investigated and we, what we've found to have the best evidence base. Um, and like, they would not want to be treated as okay, the answer to all ethics is give to the top of, uh, of the GiveWell charity um, or any other organization. They, that's just, there is so much work out there to be done that you can't possibly, it can't possibly belong to any one organization, um, which is um, why I'm kind of hopeful that um, as this push to have, the, to, to have EA become more of an intellectual question asking uh, program rather than an ideological movement is that for the stuff we don't know about, somebody can go out and start finding out um, and not treating it as this is all about um, doing the one thing we all know is the best thing to do um, because or, or trying to present it to the world as though we're all about doing this one thing we already know is the best thing to do because we don't. I'm going to 
going to take a couple of audience questions now because you guys are all submitting great questions that speak to a lot of these points. So I think, in, so one question here is like, what do you think the low-hanging fruit is for making scientific knowledge, all of the things we've been talking about, more accessible to, to EAs, to lay people, to the general public? How, how can we sort of uh, change the discussion so that, and communicate this so we, that anyone can actually just go out there and uh, under, gain the evidence and figure out what to do? Heidi? Yeah, so I mean, I, I actually think that um, answering new questions is really good, but we've also answered a lot of questions that people still don't know about. Um, and I think sharing a lot of that is really important. Um, so, you know, GiveWell has done a really good job of, uh, of particular kinds of, of international development interventions, but there's there's other things that haven't gotten a lot of coverage yet. So, so um, a lot of things that have been starting to do field replications as well. So, for example, um, sharing about more complicated interventions, right? So bed nets is really great. The deworming is really great because it's clear and simple and everybody understands it, but there's some more nuanced ones. So some of the um, recent research uh, with, with Dean Carlin and a number of others uh, about the ultra poor graduation program. It's, it's a little bit more complicated, um, but we have six studies there, um, all randomized in different locations, the same program, and it's a really exciting study. Now, of course, cost effectiveness there is a challenge, and they're still trying to, to figure that out. But I think there's, I think that's a low hanging fruit. Um, to talking more about a couple of those kinds of programs in development, and and also just like there's. N People need repetition. I know we get tired of it because we're curious and we want to new, learn new things, but um, you know, the rest of the world hasn't learned the things that we already f feel tired of. Um, and so I think some repetition of what we do know in clear ways um, would, would, would go a long way. So you can disagree with me, but. <laughs> uh, another question here is like, how can we as a community get better at communicating the things that we think to be true, lot, things that we've discussed a lot within the EA community to a wider audience, especially as the community grows and we bring in lots of different groups, different types of people, how can we sort of target our message without losing the things that we care about most? Well, I thought you did a, a thing just a few minutes ago that is a good example of this. Uh, when Amanda was talking about it, like say how confident you are, you, I think, noticed like, oh, that might, someone might interpret that as being like, express a lot of confidence. And what she meant was like, no, be clear about what credence from zero to one you're putting on your statements. And you like jumped in to clarify. And I think I often also try to have this thing module running in the back of my mind, like how would someone who wasn't already familiar with all this jargon interpret what's being said and like try to jump in and make those corrections or, you know, clarifications. And do you think that there are more social conventions we can use to communicate this? So we, someone from the audience is suggesting perhaps we should assign epistemic tags when we make statements, so communicate a credence or say like, oh, I'm very uncertain or fairly confident. I do that when I blog. Um, I recommend it to other people. Um, it's, it makes it possible to talk about things where you're uncertain um, without giving any misleading impressions that you actually are certain. Earlier, I could have mentioned some negatives of this, so I thought I would. I do think that there's a sense in which, like, it's really good to say exactly how confident you are. The negatives to this are, I think, people find it less persuasive. Sometimes when I write, uh, like, an article, this is more for like academic stuff, and I'm giving myself away here. I'll often hedge all of my statements exactly how I think that you know I'll give them degrees of plausibility, and then I'll go through the article and I'll take them all out, and I'll make the article seem really confident. And it's just because people love reading that article like a lot more. It just like it gets a better reception. Um, so, and I think that that's something we should just give up. I just think like, look, maybe it sounds snazzier to have like an article that just seems super confident. But for the sake of like epistemic virtue, we probably shouldn't do that. Um, I think the other thing is that it can be easy to start just hedging everything you say. Um, you know, sometimes this is just used as a way of like having plausible deniability in the future. If I just said, well, I was just sort of confident in that, I didn't actually commit myself to it. I think it's better to have a norm where people, if they are in fact quite confident in things, or they're very confident in things, they just state that with the understanding that in the future, um, it's a virtue for them to change their mind. So if someone is very confident and then in the future they're like, actually I was very confident and I got new evidence or I realized ways in which I was being irrational. And now I'm actually quite confident that that's false. Um, it's a really good norm to have where you, you're not hedging, you're stating your confidence truthfully and you're just willing to be wrong in the future and to change your mind. And really embrace that as like a, um, embrace that um, as you know, a, a kind of epistemic virtue rather than like a failure. 
I mean, having an institution of, of prediction markets or betting can help with those incentives because you do, like, if you have reason to be quite confident, you get monetarily rewarded or, you know, <laughs> rewarded with whatever currency you're using um, for actually, you know, saying how confident you really are. Uh, although, you know, in the in the grand scheme of um, conventions that alienate us from other people having like betting <laughs> markets isn't uh, that great, so. Heidi, I'd love to hear your take on this because you do a lot of work communicating research to the media and you know, we've talked about how they latch onto something and extremize things and Amanda commented on how it becomes more compelling when you remove all the hedging. So how do you retain nuance? Yeah, so the, the thing I mentioned in my talk yesterday is that you, you, you do come out with the headline, but it's got to be a headline that is accurate. And you know every study or a group of studies does have something, right? Um, especially if you're talking about it with the media. But then, but then what you want to do is make sure you're talking to, like backing that up with, with the media. So you're, you're letting, like I said before, you're letting them talk to other people um, about you know, why you may or may not be wrong. You're helping, you're offering to do um, fact checking for them. It's one of the things that, that we do a lot, um, a lot of background talk for, 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 for folks. There's actually a lot of articles out there that like, we don't have, even get mentioned in, but we helped kind of the media uh, suss it out a little bit more. And so I think that's, that's one of the things that we can do is um, help, help uh, the, you know, reporters have to be generalists um, and then overnight become specialists. And so the more that if you in a particular field where you have specialty can help with that, um, I think the better. And, and explaining what, what you are and aren't confident in once you've got the hook, right? So part of the challenge is getting in the door, but y your responsibility is getting in the door and backing that up. Because once you've gotten in the door, then you have, then you have the ability to kind of show the nuance and explain it. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I, tell I tell reporters a lot to, you know, if, if you read the data shows or you, if, you want, if you're tempted to say the data shows, this data shows, um, I think is a really important way. And, it, and just being really careful about the way you say things with confidence and kind of even just small the and this changes can, can really make a difference. Um. We've got some interesting comments here about how uh, knowledge has changed over time and how with, um, you know, before you could, you could only talk to the small group of people in your village or your town and get all their opinion and knowledge was much more local. Now with this expansion, with the internet, things have changed really rapidly. And it, could it be that we, our technology hasn't yet caught up and that there could be some great technological solutions to aggregating all of this knowledge, presenting it in a clear way? And how do you think we could contribute to development of some of these? So um, I actually have talked to a startup that's working on this. Um, I'm not sure how, how far they'll, they'll, they'll wind up going, the early stage. But essentially, there is a very hard problem of um, tagging and getting semantic information out of studies. Um, because right now, the state of NLP is not quite there. Nobody can read a study for you except a person. But we can get to a point where um, certain things like um, what is the independent variable um, uh, can be brought can, can be tagged um, by readers, and then hopefully, eventually, you can get you can get collaborative work on this and have people automate part of their meta analysis. So I think we may be getting to the point where collaborative human and computer tools make this much easier. Um, and there's always already citation managers and. Um, scientific sharing and collaboration tools and so on that already exist. Um, and the late lamented Delicious was great for this. Um, and whatever its successor will be, I'm sure, is going to be a useful tool. Um, I was just going to ask you, do you know if they can at least sort by, uh, by was there a control group? Um, uh, how, you know, how many studies were in the meta-analysis? How many of those studies were, were RCTs? This is all future, future yeah. tech. Um, sadly, um, right now, the world has PubMed and Google Scholar, um, which are great, but don't allow you to do any of those kinds of sophisticated things you might hope. Um, but um, this is probably getting to be the point where it's possible. So, so let's talk about what we can do right now then, and particularly when there's very little information. Like, let's say you have to make a decision, and there are no studies, or there's nothing, or it, it, it's not worth the time to go and look into the studies. Are there any sort of systemized approaches we can take to, to make a decision, to sort of figure out what to do, given this uncertainty? I don't know about systematized, <laughs> uh, but I, I, this is one area where I think it is pretty helpful to have at least a rough 
understanding of the Bayesian framework, you know, where you have your priors and your uh, evidence, the strength of evidence, um, and when something like the flossing research turns out to be weak, um, like there weren't many studies, they didn't, uh, they didn't really find an effect, um, it's helpful to be able to think, okay, well, what, you know, what is my prior on, on how helpful flossing would be? And you can take into account things like, uh, is there a plausible mechanism? In, in the case of flossing, yes, there is a plausible mechanism by which we should, you know, we could plausibly expect flossing to reduce gum disease, even if the studies haven't found it yet, that, you know, removing food that's close to your teeth uh, is, is, in other contexts, we have seen that that helps reduce gum disease. Um, there's other things that could inform your prior, uh, including just intuitions that you've developed over time. You can ask yourself whether uh, the context that the that this question of interest is in is a context that you would be you would expect yourself to have reliable intuitions about. Like, is it uh, a context in the society that you're used to in the present day, um, or is it are you thinking about the far future in a society that you're you know not likely to have reliable intuitions about? That kind of thing. Um, but this is not systematized. This is this is you know. Yeah. I, the Wild West. I guess I'm wondering about questions which aren't, you know, not really amenable to randomized controlled trials and the traditional progress in academia. Right. So there are questions, there are situations where you will not be able to find an RCT that tells you this thing one way or another. Um, there are, um, um, let, here, here's a good example. Um, there are certain kinds of um, diseases where um, for one reason or another, or another, the medical research is really terrible and doesn't talk about them. Um, the, I think um, one, of the, uh, one of the examples is some side effects of SSRIs um, are the party line is they don't exist. Um, the lived experience of many people is that they do. Um, and you will see lots of informal discussions of people complaining of these side effects. Um, and if you think you might be having one of those side effects, um, you um, have to make a rougher decision. Basically, do I trust all these forum people? How likely do I think that is that they're fooling themselves? Um, I can't find any evidence of this from the good journals. Um, and I think in this Bayesian framework, evidence is evidence. Uh, evidence from things that aren't RCTs is weaker, um, but it tells you something. You necessarily are making some judgment calls. You might say, okay, hearsay is, a lot less confident than scientific research, um, but hearsay. But a lot of hearsay plus a mechanism probably nudges me a little bit. Um, you like by by acting in the world, you are making an assessment of this one way or another. So thinking consciously about it and saying yes, I am making an assessment uh, is a lot more, um, I guess, higher integrity than saying I don't know, uh, but I'm going to make a decision based on my gut. Sure. So I, I want to jump really far away from any, anything to do with health or things like that. Like within effective altruism, we have all these big open questions and things that we argue about all the time, like should more or fewer EAs be earning to give and how do we compare this cause area and that cause area? Like how about we, like, you know, the f four of you right now try to work through one of those problems. Like how would you, how would you begin answering the, this question of um, like how, how do we decide, you know, should, should more EAs be earning to give? How, how can we aggregate knowledge on, for this question. I'm throwing you a hard one at the last minute. Yeah. <laughs> this wasn't on our brief. <laughs> <laughs> Snuck at it. I mean, I'd, I'd probably start by just trying to break the question down into the parameters that might influence our decision one way or the other. Like, you know, what is the, um, uh, uh, what is the expected contribution from someone who earns to give? Um, what factors like determine how confident we can be in that? Um, what are the alternatives? How much do they, uh, you know, pay off? Uh, what are the flow-through effects that we might care about? Like, um, like how? What do we think is the conversion rate of like one person who's earning to give? How much do they influence other people to join EA or do something valuable? It's sort of like the trade-off where you know if you're a hardcore vegan who you know won't eat any meat or animal product whatsoever, um, then you like maybe save more animals, but also that's a harder sell to convince other people to adopt. So there's a trade-off there. So I would just start by like listing out all of the things that we might want to try to estimate. 
Yeah, so what I'm hearing, a combination of all the examples that Sarah's gone through in this, is like the, the first step is basically figuring out what it is that we already know about the question in the world and trying to quantify that and, and then figuring out what questions we can quantify that will help us figure out the answer. So it's interesting, you just listed off a whole bunch of different questions like, oh, we should think about this and then think about this. And I guess then the next step might be to go out and like try to find answers to those sub-questions and incorporate them in. So Amanda, looks like you have something to say. Oh, I just was thinking that sometimes, um, sometimes like getting more accurate is like this really shiny, distracting thing. Um, so one thing that I was thinking there is it's really important in this case and in the case before that we really think about the costs of each of the options. So sometimes you just get a really low cost option that's very unlikely to have disastrous negative effects. And people will like spend a lot of time like really like, oh, but how positive is this? Is it actually positive? Is it more positive than this other thing? And then I'm like, look, if it would take us five minutes to implement it and just check it out or just to implement it and then see what the outcome is, then just do it. Like um, you don't, you can sometimes just go in like with basically your prior and very little other information if you know that there's not gonna be like large negative effects. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes like, costs you know so in this case it might be like look in our option set is there a cheap option so if it's something like an earning to give i mean at least at, on a personal level with people i'm like well can you try this out for a month and if so how how expensive is that month to you if it's not very expensive and you can try something out and it doesn't seem like it's going to be disastrous then then see how it goes and we'll get some information that way rather than having to like gather evidence for a month and then and then like make a larger decision try and make a cheaper decision now if you can if you don't have a lot of information yeah one thing i found useful um in having arguments if you have like a really good willing argument partner is to diagram it out um with um workflow is great for this uh for those of you who like technology uh you can infinitely nest bullet points so you can you can navigate to okay, what part do we actually disagree on? Um, so like you listed a bunch of things that we could, like if we wanted to have an argument about um, should more EAs be earning to give, uh, we could do research on a bunch of these, but we'd want to first narrow down, okay, where do we even disagree? Um, or, or, or like if we don't disagree, if we don't disagree what, are, what are the parameters that seem like they would most influence, right. that we're most uncertain about and would have the most impact on the overall answer? And, and usually you do want to start off with goals, I think. Um, like. If you have any question that starts with the word should, um, you, you, you want to clarify for what, because you might just be talking past each other if you two have different aims. Right, like are you assuming that the only goal that we are optimizing for here is like maximum money donated to EA, or are we also including like the personal happiness and well-being of people yeah. who are earning to give, for example? interesting. I feel like we could just keep discussing this issue forever and talk a lot about the different technical options to solve the problem, how we can sort of identify better resources and use them, what we should learn more about, and then also different social interventions as well, what we want to promote within the EA community so that we can become this like truth-seeking community that's really focused on developing novel intellectual content, making progress on some of these big ideas. And unfortunately, we're running out of time, so we're going to have to wrap it up shortly. Uh, any final thoughts? Just jump in. One thing you've been itching to say, haven't got a chance. Yeah. That's good questions. <laughs> well, lucky for, lucky for all of you, if you want to ask any more questions later on, we'll be sort of, some of us might be out and poorly, you can always ask us a bit more. But yeah, I guess like what we've touched on here is mostly, is like, Figuring out what to do is really difficult, but we do have a lot of tools available. And as a community with people who are specialized in lots of different areas, of different areas of expertise, that we can actually make a lot of progress. And sort of everyday lay people, who even if they're not academics and not really familiar with the literature, can actually look into something for five minutes and come away with a better understanding of the world. So you know, I challenge all of you to go out there and like find, find an issue that you know very little about, or find something that you've just sort of sort of gone along with because like your parents told you it was true or all of your friends think that it's the right thing to do. And, and spend five minutes looking that up and seeing what the evidence says. And, and from there you can sort of build and, and seek, become more curious and learn more.